All right, the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Last time we studied the passage at the beginning of chapter 6, which, six, which included the disciples' miraculous feeding of more than 5,000 people as Jesus blessed and broke a few barley loaves and, and a couple little fish and gave to them to distribute. You know, we, we uh, hear Jesus fed the 5,000. Well, if you look in the scripture, it says the disciples fed the 5,000. But Jesus did the miracle. So we finished by reading verse 14. And that leads us into the next section. So for our text today, I'll start reading uh, at verse 14 and chapter 6 from the New King James Version. So if you wonder if your words are different, you know where I'm at. The Gospel of John chapter 6, verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus perceived they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea and got into the boat and went over to the sea towards Capernaum. It was already dark and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat. And they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at land where they were going. Now some of the earlier signs that we had seen recorded by John were uh, where Jesus turned the water into wine uh, at, a, at a wedding feast because uh, to help keep the groom from being embarrassed by running out of food and drink for the, the people there. Then he healed an official's son. Uh, who had a son at the point of death, and he healed him just by speaking the word. Uh, he healed an invalid that had been laying there for decades by the pool of Bethesda, when, and nobody else cared enough to even move him to get him into the water to be healed. Uh, and so <clears throat> we're coming right off now of where Jesus fed 5,000 people, men, plus the women, plus the children, um, not just to show off, but... You know, those 5,000 uh, that were there were actually there to listen to him teaching. They wanted to hear what he had to say, and, and uh, their thoughts were not to come and get food. They didn't come for a, din a feast or dinner. They just came to, to be, well, they did, to be fed on the Word of God. And they had a feast of Jesus teaching them, and, and uh, then they got hungry. And so, um, what were the, the, the people's reaction after this all happened? And that's what we read about today. In verse 14, it's the, the people thought, this is the, this is the one. This is the prophet that they'd, been to, they'd heard about that was predicted by Moses. They, they felt was predicted by Moses. There was a lot of stock put into this prediction um, by the, the rabbis during that time. And, you know, they were looking forward to this, uh, the, the prophet. There were many prophets that uh, God sent to the people uh, of Israel, but there is one special prophet that they were talking about, and, and uh, this was the Messiah. A lot of them didn't understand all the details of who the Messiah was, but they recognized there was someone special coming. So verse 14, it says that, Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. You know, this way Jesus provided, the way that Jesus provided bread and food for the multitude and, and the open air, and kind of in a wilderness place, you know, it was kind of a side of a mountain up in the Golan Heights area. It reminded these people of how God had worked through Moses. When, you know, all of a sudden they were out there in the wilderness and they realized, hey, <laughs> we're getting hungry. We need food. And, and Moses provided, God provided through Moses to them the manna in the wilderness. So, you know, that was a connection that was going on in their, their mind. It was more than just food for the people at that point. It was a sign from God that this is a Moses-like person. This is a, a very important person. Uh, one of the rabbis later, at a later date, is credited with observing that uh, as the first redeemer caused manna to descend, so will the last redeemer cause manna to descend. Uh, and that general idea seemed to be the consensus in the first century that you know, that would, that would happen. And they're seeing it happen in front of their eyes. I don't know that that's 
Honestly, it's not, I, I don't think it's in the Bible. Maybe y'all have some, some insight, but I don't think it said the last Redeemer, the Messiah will bring bread into your hands. But there are a lot of references to bread and we studied that out <coughs> back when we, we uh, studied out uh, in John chapter one, I believe. Y'all look it up. <laughs> but when, uh, when Nathaniel came to Jesus, you'll see that, that information. So let's jump, go on to uh, verse 15, where the people attempt to make Jesus an earthly king. It says, therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, what'd he do? He said, where's the robes? No, he said he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. You know, they had suddenly seen this unusual man, Jesus. He had miraculous power. They must have said something to themselves like, uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get him to come on our side, help us drive out these Roman oppressors? You know, we have all these, all these uh, foreigners trying to run our country, and we want to have someone that will bring us freedom again, the kind of freedom we want. Uh, they wanted to make him king. And it doesn't say they, they asked him to be king. It says they wanted to take him by force to be king. <laughs> I, can't, I can't identify with that experience. That's never happened to me. Uh, <laughs> king was a, a political title. He was a ruler. Um, I'm not going to get into all the things God said about having a king to the, to the Israelites before, but it wasn't really the, you know, he was supposed to be their, their ruler uh, and God and not a king because, again, it's an earthly title. But the crowd was willing to support Jesus, and they wanted, they didn't want him to love him particularly. They just wanted to use him to throw off the Roman oppressors, um, both either directly in Judea that was, Rome, that was ruled directly by the Romans or indirectly um, up in uh, Galilee where Herod Antipas was the, uh, the king in that, that time. So, you know, we have a little, little conflict with people trying to understand what's going on here. Um, but, you know, that wasn't God's plan. It would have been nice. I mean, wouldn't you love to have, you know, Jesus as our president or <laughs> your, you know, governor or whatever? I know he'd make a better one than, than any of them. But, uh, you know, that wasn't God's plan. And so it says he departed again to a mountain alone by himself. Jesus wasn't impressed or seduced by the crowd that wanted to make him king. He turned his back on the crowd wanted to make him king. He went to pray because he was more interested in hearing from and being with his heavenly father than he was in hearing the applause of men. Now that's quite a contrast to what we had read uh, in the last chapter about the, the people that were criticizing Jesus because they wanted to, they, they loved the, the praise of men rather than the, the approval of God. So we see a contrast here in Jesus. He wants to hear and wants to be with his heavenly father. To Jesus, the prospect of an earthly kingdom was um, only one thing. It was the temptation of the enemy, the temptation of the devil, to try to get him off track. Um, obviously, he rejected it. He just walked away from it. So, thank God he did. The crowds that he saw, they were excited. They were, um, you know, really wanting to carry him off and make him king and, and oppose the civil authorities that they did not agree with at the time. You know, what's your reaction when you don't agree with your civil authorities here? Um, I'll let you stew on that for just a little bit. You know, it may have even been that his disciples got caught up in the excitement just a little bit in there. And we'll see why, why in just a moment. But one writer said, He who is already king has come to open his kingdom to men. But in their blindness, they try to force him to be the kind of king that they want. Thus, they fail to get the king that they want and also lose the kingdom that he offers. It takes a moment to digest that a little bit. But our life lesson, I'll try to make it a little bit more simple. It says, seek to receive what God wants to offer us, not what we think God should offer us. Seek to receive what God wants to offer us, not what we think God should offer us. Now, if we go back in Matthew, uh, Matthew and Mark both record parts of this incident. If we go back to Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 23, we see Jesus also sent the disciples away. Okay, he sent, 
you know, this, this is where I'm thinking maybe the disciples did get anxious and say, you know what they say, they want to make you king, Jesus, let's, let's do it, you know, let's go ahead and, you know, let's make you king, you're, you're the best ruler. And while that may have been true, that was not God's plan. Matthew 20, 14, 22 to 23, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. <clears throat> and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up upon the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. What a contrast. We see just a few hours earlier that the people were in need and the disciples were telling Jesus, send them away. But Jesus said, no, they have a need. I'm going to meet their need. Actually, he told them, you meet their need. And then he provided for them to meet their need. And then Jesus first ministered to their needs. And then he sent them away. Uh, he sent them away for several reasons. One of them, a uh, very obvious one at this point, is that it was not God's plan to make him king. He did not want them trying to do something that was not in God's plan. Also, to consider what happened. To, to think about what God had done in their lives that day. To praise God for the provision he had made and for them um, both learning about Jesus, learning about God's kingdom as he had taught them for hours, and also to share with others. So when, they, when you go away from Jesus' presence, it's not just to you know, relax and do your own thing. It's to do what God's will is. So our life lesson, get another life lesson, brother and sister. It's uh, our life lesson here is to minister to people in need. Don't send them away. Minister to people in need. Don't send them away. And remember your mission when you minister to people in need. I think a lot of, a lot of ministries that we see around us and a lot of people that do good work in our world had a good mission to start with and they're continuing good works but they forgot what they were doing somewhere in time um, there's a soup kitchen not far from us and my wife and me and my daughters served in that soup kitchen we served tables we washed dishes that was, I had, <clears throat> that was my favorite part is washing dishes and um, you know, the kids, when they were small, they loved serving the tables, and um, it was a great mission. But we realized that something had gone a little awry with that, with that soup kitchen. They no longer shared Jesus with the people that came in. Oh, they showed the love of Jesus they had in their hearts, but they didn't let you talk to people about Jesus and how he can change their lives, and that's why we're here doing what we're doing. And so... Even in our churches today, even in our own lives and ministry, uh, we need to remember this life lesson is for us to minister to those people in need, both spiritually and physically, and in the other ways that they have those needs. And don't send them away to somebody else, even though it might be convenient. Oh, you need food? There's a soup kitchen down the road. Yeah, at noon. Let me, let me drive you there, drop you off, and not tell you about Jesus. No. Uh, in our church, uh, we love to have a... Have, we collect food. There's, in fact, across the back of the church, there's a, a big, several long tables with food that people bring in. And when people in the community are in need, they come in, they ask for, you know, do you have food for us? And yes, we do. We do a little due diligence to make sure that they're not hitting 15 churches a day and going out and selling the food. Um, yeah, some people do that. But at the same time, they're going to hear the gospel. They're going to share the gospel. Many people have come to Jesus and uh, many people are, are still at the church that have come to Jesus because uh, we ministered to their need and did not forget the mission. I'm talking about my ch church in Kernersville. Um, maybe someday there will be a community here in this, uh, this area that we will do the same as, as the Lord leads. So again, don't send them away. After, sen after sending the disciples, now this was after ministering to them, after he just, Jesus sent the disciples across the sea, and uh, the multitude said, okay, you can go home now. It's late. It's dark. You know, the Sabbath is coming soon. You know, Jesus went up to the mountain to pray. Jesus had seen that he could have been taken by force, but instead he takes this time to pray about what's coming up. <clears throat> we kind of have an insight. We've, we've read the rest of the book, so we know what's coming up. But uh, the disciples and all those did not. 
Now in verse 16 and 17, it says, Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea towards Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Verse 18, Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. Now we know from the other uh, Gospels, that, uh, or I mean for, for the verses coming up, uh, they were about three or four miles out in the middle of the sea on their way to Capernaum where that wind started. Um, I noticed they, they didn't insist that Jesus come with them, but Jesus kind of said, okay, you go ahead, go on before me. Uh, so that's okay. Uh, but now the boat the disciples were on was getting tossed around. Could have been taking on water, uh, could have been close to capsizing, we're not sure. But they were not really happy about the situation. <laughs> Um, it may have been overloaded. I mean, the disciples were sent away, the people were sent away. Maybe all of, I mean, maybe it was overloaded. Uh, we not, we're not sure. Um, but in verse 19, it says, when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. Now, it must have taken some time for them to get that three or four miles away from the seashore. Because, you know, if you send someone away and you're going to pray and fellowship with God... Usually that doesn't happen in three minutes, you know. <laughs> Take time with God. That could be another life lesson here, is when you spend time with the Heavenly Father, take your time, pray, and listen, and read His Word to find out what He has to say for you. When you're fellowship with the Heavenly Father, take your time to pray, to read God's Word, and to hear what He has to say to you. Now, verse 20 says that he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Now, in the middle of the sea, this boat's getting tossed around. The disciples see Jesus walking on the water. Probably hasn't seen that before. Okay, This was, and, and I love that we're given the description of how far they were. I mean, you can go to the sea that they were on, and you can... You know, you, you can see how far three or four miles is out into that. And they were not like on the seashore. And they weren't deceived into thinking, um, you know, Jesus was actually walking along the sand by the side of the sea. And they thought he was walking on water because they were disoriented. No, no. Um, they, it says, verse 21, it says, They willingly received him into the boat and immediately the boat was at the land they were going to. Oh. Well, some, some people say that, so he wasn't really walking on the water because he was immediately at the land. Well, that's a whole other story. Um, in the middle of the sea, it's getting tossed around. If you look back in Matthew 14 and Mark 6, first, they thought they were seeing a ghost. <clears throat> okay, if, you're, if your boat's next to the seashore, <clears throat> not only are you probably hitting into <laughs> the sandbar, but also you're not going to think, there's a ghost walking along the seashore. You think, that's a person. Some of them are probably freaking out, you know, like, oh, man, I need new glasses. I, it looks like somebody walking out here on the water in the middle of this mess. No, they were just trying to figure it out. But Jesus said, don't be afraid, it's me. And I love this because he didn't say, it's Jesus. You know, I'm the Christ, I'm the Messiah. You know, it's all right, I got him under control. He just said, it is I, don't be afraid. They knew Jesus voice thought that was so cool they knew Jesus voice do you know Jesus voice in the, in the uh, Gospels we see uh, the shepherd we see the illustration of the shepherd and the, it says the, the sheep know his voice we'll study that after a while the sheep know his voice don't listen to voices that you don't know don't don't trust in people that you don't know the voice of these people these disciples knew Jesus. The people around him, the others that weren't disciples, probably did not know his voice as well. May have been freaking out too. Um, but after they received Jesus into the boat, we see Mark 6, 21, that this, the winds ceased, everything calmed down. I'm going to back up just a little bit. Um, and again, I love the, looking at the various Gospels, um, details that they include and some that they don't include. Uh, as, as you go through um, go through John, you'll see, especially with John, John was the youngest disciple um, and probably the youngest when he wrote the, the gospel account. And he kind of had a little competition thing going on there with Peter. So um, sometimes he wouldn't put something in there about Peter that we see in other gospels. And sometimes um, 
you know, we see him put something else in there, like uh, when they ran to the tomb. You know, John just, after Jesus was risen, you know, John just happened to mention that he beat Peter to the tomb because he was faster. Uh, he didn't say, because I'm faster, but he just, he just mentioned that little fact. So in this, this particular case, he, he left out in detail, but Matthew records it. And see, you know, where, where Peter was a little confused, Jesus had spoken already, and Peter answered him in, in Matthew 28, uh, 14, 28 to 32, it says, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command to me that, to come to you on the water. <laughs> so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Ah, oh, man, I tell you, I don't have that kind of faith. But Peter had faith there. But then he started looking around. Verse 30, but when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind had ceased. Now, Jesus had commanded him, you know, said, told him, come on out. He wanted to come out and he, and he stepped out on that. Sometimes when we step out on faith, you know, that's a good thing. We step out on faith and do what Jesus has told us to do. And when things, we start looking around and things aren't going the way we, we thought they would or you know, we see some other things coming at us that we weren't expecting. We're like, no, 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 this is the wrong place. I must not have heard Jesus' voice. At that point in time, you have two choices. You can just give it up or you can do what Peter did. Lord, save me. And he did. So I, I think that was such a cool story. And, and even though it looks like Jesus is ta chastising him uh, for having little faith, you know, I think... Everybody that was in that situation was thinking, actually, Peter was the one that had more faith than the rest of us because we weren't going to step out in that water. And, uh, and so he was just giving them a lesson that this is a, it's a faith walk. All of our actions, everything we do with the Lord is a faith walk. And you have to put our, our faith in him. So it also says immediately they were at land. And again, on this part, I don't know, um, you know how long the event took place where they saw Jesus walking, how long he walked alongside them before they recognized him, um, or, you know, how long, the, when Peter was out there and went down and Jesus pulled him back um, and they, they got in the boat, if they started talking and they were, you know, they were so happy that Jesus was there and the sea calmed down and then all of a sudden they realized, hey, you know, we made it to land and they were happy for that. Or if Jesus miraculously calls that boat, to get to land so that the people that were in there would not be afraid anymore. I'm not sure. Um, I don't think it matters. <laughs> if y'all have some insight on that, let me know. But, uh, but what we see in verse 33 <clears throat> is that it said, those who were in the boat came and worshiped God saying, truly, you are the son of God. That was in, in Matthew's account. Okay is truly you are the son of God. Now, so, so again, we see here, I'll just remind you that the boat was not the disciples' private cruise liner. <laughs> Don't know how big it was, but it was, you know, most likely it was a boat open for public use or for private hire, and uh, it was, had more than the disciples in it. And for, for a long time, I wondered, well, you know, the disciples, they knew about Jesus. They had seen his miracles. They'd been with him. They performed miracles in his name. You know, back at the beginning of the chapter, we see that. And they were given the accounts of it. So what was the big deal with Jesus walking on the water at this point? And why did Jesus even do that? His disciples already knew that he was, he was uh, divine, that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. And so this is, this is the answer right here. When it, back where it, it talked about the boat, getting into the boat, uh, there were more people in there. It wasn't just Jesus and his disciples. What they did was a sign of faith. It was a sign, a miraculous sign to the others that were in the boat that kind of cemented. Back earlier we see in John where he said, this is the prophet that's come into the world. And now they're looking and saying, this is really the son of God. It really gave them an, an additional layer of that belief. And as we know, our, our belief uh, tends to come in layers or stages. You know, we believe that there is a man named Jesus. <laughs> you know, some people have not even gotten there yet. They deny that. 
but then we, we build up and, you know, oh, Jesus was wonderful. Okay, he was good. Yes, Jesus did things that were miraculous. Yes, and then Jesus is, you know, he taught things that affect my life. It's like, mm, maybe I don't want him now because I have to change my life. I want to do it my way instead of his way. Okay, I'll get over that. You know, I, I, be, I believe I trust him for my life and I trust that he is the son of God. These are different layers of belief. And so people are at different layers and the men and women that were in the boat at this point in time, um, they, they kind of got that, that same uh, view that Jesus is the son of God and that everything he was teaching them is something to be followed. So uh, we, we've seen the 5,000 people come to Jesus, the disciples um, were getting tossed in the sea. Jesus walked on the water to them. He calmed them down. And I believe the passage reiterates in Matthew uh, 6, 24 to 34, where Jesus told us basically, don't worry about this stuff. <laughs> I've got you, I've got you covered. God cares about you so much. You don't need to be worrying about these little things. Uh, I'm going to read that section. It's a little long, but I, I think it's very uh, applicable to us today. Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is life not more than the food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So if God, now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. These are some wonderful words of comfort for us and also words to help us to not only believe in, but again, I, it keeps coming back to, you know, John uh, 1, 12, you know, if you believe in, not just believe that there is a Jesus, but believe in, trust in, cling to, rely upon Jesus for every day. God will provide with us, for us, when we trust in him, even when it feels like it's not possible. Uh, it also tells us in the storms of life, God can calm, calm every storm that we're facing. Just need to, you know, have faith in him. Just believe him, what he says, that he can still perform those miracles in our lives. And he does. Our life lesson here to, to close out is God cares for us the same in all circumstances of life. Let him minister to you where you are and in whatever circumstance you're in. God cares for us the same in all circumstances in life. Let him minister to you where you are and in whatever circumstance you're in. Now, when we, after we get done, I'm going to uh, play a song, Casting Crowns, and you probably might be familiar with it, Praise You in the Storm. And this is what we have to remember to do, and that is to praise God in whatever storm of life that we are going through and whatever we're in. God will calm the storm, get us to the land, even on the other side of the, of the sea, if that's where he wants us so we can have that faith and so we can continue to believe in him. Now next time we're going to pick up the, the, the study as we move from these miraculous events into what Jesus wants to teach us from these events. For now, what is your response to Jesus? Do you believe? Do you rely on? Do you cling to? Do you trust it fully in him? And I certainly hope so. So as we depart, if you have some more questions, be sure to ask me if you're watching online. Uh, you know, send a comment or a note. But I want to play, pray a blessing over you from God's word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, thank you all for being with us. And God bless you. Have a great day.